Today, we will find out, and I will show you the difference in which gaming PC is better in terms of price and performance. A PC for an undemanding gamer for 500 bucks versus a PC for 3000 bucks. And at the end, we'll try to connect a video card that consumes 450 watts to a power supply unit that produces only 312 watts. And let's see how long such a power supply can last under such a load. For such a small budget of only $500, we will not need such a cool case. It's too expensive and I did not even include it in the price. But I needed it only to make a good preview, so let's disassemble it completely. It's better. Before starting the video, I'd like to ask you, what PDF editor you use for work and study. Are you still using an expensive and complex editor? You should try UPDF, one of the most feature-packed PDF editors out there. You could edit, annotate, convert, and OCR, filling form, combine, organize, protect, use AI, etc. And let me tell you, it's been a game changer for me. With UPDF, you can do so much more than just the basics. You can annotate any PDF, edit it while preserving the original format, and even have optical character recognition to interact with written text inside images. And you can not only convert PDF into other formats, but also create from other formats to PDF. And here's the mind-blowing part. UPDF integrates with AI, allowing you to do things like summarizing highlighted text, explaining, translating, and enhancing your content. It's like having a personal assistant right at your fingertips. Imagine how convenient it would be for a professional AI to help you detect the possible risks when you sign a labor or sales contract. Now, let's talk about pricing. UPDF not only offers a feature-packed experience, but is also incredibly affordable if you'd like to upgrade to an advanced version. It's just 12% of Adobe Acrobat's price. And guess what? They even offer a perpetual plan, something Adobe doesn't even provide. And the best part? With just one license, you can use UPDF across all your devices on macOS, iOS, Android, and Windows. It's convenient, efficient, and truly fantastic for those on the go. Now, here's an exclusive offer just for you. Click on the top link in the description to get a whopping 63% discount on the UPDF Pro and AI package. And by one year, get 14 months. Yep, you heard it right, 63%. Don't miss out on this incredible offer. Act fast, unleash your productivity, and elevate your PDF game with UPDF. Click that link below now. Let's now tell you and show you the components of these two PCs. I'll start with the graphics card. In the PC for 500 bucks, there will be such a fashionable youth graphics card, AMD RX 700 XT, priced from $125 to $150. I also forgot to say that in order to build a PC that would be able to play games on such a budget, you need to buy some components secondhand. And this particular video card is used. I bought it for $150. And what's in the PC for $3,000, you ask? And here we have a large caliber weapon. Damn, I haven't even assembled the computers yet and they're already steaming. Anyway, RTX 3090. This weapon is not new either. You can buy it on eBay for about $700 to $1,000. I recommend that if you want to buy an RTX 3090 then take them from two vendors, EVGA and MSI Supreme X. That's exactly what it is. These two cards have a better memory cooling system, and the memory of almost all 3090 and 3080 also heats up to 100 degrees. So if you buy used, then buy only from these two vendors or with water cooling. But it's too expensive. I just bought this card for 800 bucks, and it turns out that one card costs 150 and the other is $800, and we'll find out how much such an overpayment is justified later. A graphics card GTX 1080 is also suitable for a budget of $150. If you're collecting a budget working PC, then this card will be more suitable for you. But we're gonna play games here. So, top for the money for games, I consider five 700 XT power supply units. You can try to cram everything into a PC for such a small budget. I have such a disgusting power supply unit of only 312 watts lying around at home, which is more than 15 years old and costs almost nothing. But you should have a power supply unit that produces 500 watts, purely 12 volt line, and it is desirable that it has two cables of 8 pin power supply for the graphics card. The price of such a unit will be $60. As for the power supply unit on a more expensive PC, 
I did not find it in an American store, but I counted it as an analog for the price of $200. For this price, you can buy a 750 watt or 1000 watt power supply. For this price, you can buy a 750 watt or 1000 watt power supply. I have a 750 watt one. Although this computer consumes more than 750 watts at its peak, but as a confident owner with 510 years old of experience, I know that it'll not load it like that. In short, 60 bucks and 200 bucks. So much steam. Although I haven't even turned it on yet. The motherboard. I should have started with it, but I missed something. I bought the motherboard, RAM, and CPU back in 2020, and then it was still considered a not bad kit for work and gaming. It's price too, Chinese motherboard, 32 gigabytes of memory, 18 core, 36 threads processor for only $161. That's at this point in time. While another PC has a motherboard, 64 gigabytes of DDR5 memory and an i9-14900K processor, and all together for a crazy price of $1,000. Let's go in order. Let's start with motherboards. You look at this abomination, and now look at what we have under the hood. A Chinese motherboard can barely withstand a processor that consumes 150 watts. And on this motherboard, I boldly put 1.5 volts on the CPU with one foot. The processor with a consumption of 400 watts, this board calmly holds. The RAM in the kit for 161 bucks can be purchased with 32 gigabytes of DDR3 memory, which on this platform will work in four channel mode and output results as DDR4. In a kit for $1,000, you can count on 64 gigabytes with two sticks of DDR5 excellent memory which can still be overclocked normally. Now, a CPU. In a kit for bums, they put a processor for a very ancient but powerful platform for its time. This is Socket 2011 V3, and this is the top CPU for that socket, Intel Xeon E5 2696 V3, which has 18 underdeveloped cores and 36 useless threads, as well as a monstrous cache of 45 megabytes. Once, in the distant 2014, this processor cost $4,100 and was installed in servers. But now, it has dropped so much that the Chinese sell them wholesale in bags on AliExpress for hanging for next to nothing. The other thing is in the PC for 3000 bucks. Of course, it smokes much stronger than the Xeon, and you have to screw it very hard so that this beast does not jump out of the socket. i9-14900K. 24 cores, 32 threads, and until you start talking in the comments that this is renamed 13900K, I'll show you the physical size difference between these CPUs. What a huge Xeon compared to the i9. Look at the thickness of the PCB. The i9 is three times thinner. 1,700 pins versus 2,011 pins. Also, in this video, we'll compare the 16 power efficient cores with the i9 versus 18 cores with Xeon. As for cooling our monsters, this dip cool for 20 bucks is quite enough to cool our Xeon. But to cool 14,900K, we need this giant thing from Lian Li. The price is 160 bucks. There is solder under the covers of both CPUs, and if you want to save another 20 bucks, you can use your mouth or even your tongue to cool the Xeon. I ate the dog on this platform, and I know for sure that this small radiator is enough to cool this archaic CPU, although this cooler also steams well. By the way, at the expense of the expression, I ate the dog, this is phraseology that in my language means to understand something very well or to know something very well. I decided to leave this expression in the English version to ask you, what idioms and slang expressions do you have? Write them in the comments, I'll be very interested. As for storage in a PC for 500 bucks, I decided to completely abandon hard drives and bought a two terabyte M2 NVMe SSD Intel 660p. The price is $100. It is of course not the best you can buy in the M2 format and its speed will not please your eye but its data access speed is much better than archaic HDDs, which will soon remain on the pages of history. I chose two terabytes because you saw the size of modern AAA projects, from 100 to 200 gigabytes for one game. An SSD per terabyte is already not enough. What about a PC for 3000? Then here are two SSDs Samsung 980 Pro of two terabytes each. 
100 bucks against 260 bucks. Let's count everything together now. CPU plus RAM plus motherboard, $160, plus a video card for $150 is already $310, plus SSD for 100 is already 410, a power supply unit for 60, and a cooling radiator for 20 comes out to $490, and that leaves $10 for a box of bananas in which you'll put all this stuff. But I would advise you to collect such crap on the table, because in fact, it is a server, and the Chinese are not able to make this motherboard able to control the speed of the chassis fans, and they always work at 100%. It's good that even though the CPU cooler is controlled. As for the PC for $3,000, then you see the prices on the screen, and something here doesn't come out to $3,000, but only $2,560. It should have been more if the graphics card is new, but buying a new video card of the previous series is stupid. So I entered the price of the video card, how much I bought it for. Now, what about a very rough comparison of the real power of these two processors? In CPU, Z i9 scores more than two times more than Xeon, and roughly speaking, 14,900K is two times more powerful than Xeon. If you compare them in video rendering, i9 really renders in two times faster than Xeon. Nine minutes versus almost 20 minutes. This is if the rendering is only on the processor. That is, it does not matter what graphics card you have, the result will be the same. Now, what about the RX 5 700 XT graphics card and the 312 watt power supply unit? It's obvious that the video card will have to be undervolted. I made the following settings and got 50 to 60 watts less energy consumption. As for the performance of the GPU in this mode, here is a comparison of this card. Undervolted from the left, without settings in the center, and overclocked from the right. The difference is two frames per second between the worst and the best result, so you really don't need to worry about the loss of performance because there is no loss. Counter-Strike 2. So as not to be repeated a million times, the resolution and graphic settings are written on the screen. Well, on Radeon, we can get 100 to 135 frames per second on a full HD monitor. While on the 3090, we can unlock the potential of a 360Hz full HD monitor and 240Hz 2K. Alan Wake 2, watch this. At these graphic settings and native 2K on PC from 3090, we get stable 20 frames per second and it's terrible. Turn on DLSS quality, then we get 30 to 32 stable frames. On a PC with 5700 XT on low with FSR Ultra Performance, we get a very unstable 44 frames per second. This is what 30 frames per second can look like. On the right, everything is stable and you will enjoy playing the game. And on the left, you'll want to smash the keyboard against your head. Look at what's going on with the frame rate on a PC for 500 bucks. It's just terrible. And it's very difficult to play like that. Starfield on ultras, if you're not a demanding gamer. Then on a PC for 500 bucks, you can grit your teeth and play on low graphics. You can generally get as much as 40 frames per second, which in relation to a PC for 3K dollars, damn, I'd like to see more frames in a game that does not even have RTX. Of course, it's very comfortable to play, but at the same time, it is expensive. A Plague Tale Requiem. And here, I decided to add the GTX 1080 to the test so that you can see what else this old wooden thing is capable of. And in principle, you can play Cyberpunk 2077 more or less comfortably on all PCs. These are the settings for 3K dollars. For $500, everything is also only without RTX and FSR. And I noticed such a pattern that in some games with DLSS, the picture looks even better than the native resolution. Maybe it's due to aggressive sharpening, but not all games are like that. In principle, you can play for less than $500, but clearly not on GTX 1080. God of War. RX 5 700 XT feels so good that I even set 2K. About 60 frames per second can be obtained in this wonderful game. And if you are not a demanding gamer and your eye can't see the difference between 2K and 1080p, then in 1080p, you'll be able to see at least plus 15 frames per second. Raising the stakes, Red Dead Redemption 2. This is what the graphics settings were on both PCs. Why is the recording on the RX 5 700 XT so green? Well, the game runs very well on both PCs. It's quite comfortable to play, but why does the gameplay recording on the AMD card give green? The Last of Us 
unfortunately, I was too lazy to download this game on a PC for 3K again, so I added old gameplay recordings to the tests, but it can be seen that the frames per second is two times higher on the right in any case. The Witcher Well, on GTX 1080, everything is very bad. On RX 5 700 XT, it's normal, but on 3090 RTX, it got in the eye. If you turn on DLSS, the picture immediately becomes soapy, and I don't like it so much. If you compare the frames at 3090 with RTX and without that, of course, the picture is a little better in the game with RTX, but this is terrible. The FPS drops by two times. Especially on these frames, you can clearly see the difference where there is RTX and where it is not. So, without RTX in, we have poor townsmen, and on RTX, we have poor townswomen. And on RX 5 700 XT, we should have poor towns gamer. It's all fun, but these were basically graphics card tests. Let's now see what the processors themselves are capable of in games. Let's put this GTX 1050 Ti in that computer, and we'll see what happens. It's not so easy for 14900K, 640x480 DLSS Ultra Performance, 213 times 116 and 14900K does from the graphics card the bottleneck. I don't know what to do to unload this GPU. That's why only 90 frames per second. When at the same time, our 18-core Xeon is not even able to load the GTX 1050 Ti and produces two times less frames. That's how poor it is. But the game runs smoothly, no jokes here. A Plague Tale, 14900K. So much gives out a lot of frames that Amicia represents a stronger and independent woman on the PC on the right. Compared to the version on the left, somehow Xeon gives out two times less frames, but it is still comfortable to play on it. Counter-Strike 2. There's nothing to comment here, 180 frames against almost 400 frames per second. The game runs well on both PCs. Cyberpunk. And finally, a game in which there is no emphasis on GPU. At 14,900K, Xeon barely reaches 600 frames per second, while on i9, 140 to 160 frames per second. The difference is 100 frames per second. Ghost Runner, well, here you'll have no problems even on Xeon, more than 100 frames per second almost always. The game is not particularly demanding, so even not demanding gamers will be able to play it, but oh my god, look at how the i9 works. The FPS is almost three times more. It's already something. It produces three times more frames per second, but unfortunately, it still costs five times more. Starfield. Well, Xeon clearly does not carry the load here. It is no longer comfortable. While the i9 also asks for supplements, the card is loaded at 100%, but this is almost the maximum that this processor can do. 120 to 130 frames per second is the maximum that the i9 can do in this game. Witcher. This is another game in which the Xeon almost dies to give out 45 unstable frames. Another thing on the i9. Well, now let's see what happens if I turn off all the productive cores at 14900K and leave only the energy efficient one. For this, I had to go into BIOS and look for settings that disable hybrid trading and cores. By the way, if you turn off all productive cores, the PC will not turn on. You need to leave at least one core on. Now, if we go into the game, here's the first core. It's productive. I know this because the frequency of 5.7 GHz is written next to it, and it is always at 100% loaded. This is how I solved this problem. We call the task manager, find our game among the processors, and selected go to details, then selected, set affinity, and now we can disable the productive core that prevents us from doing very reliable, honest, and non-bribey tests. Now, as you can see, the load on the first core is gone, and this means that it's time to screw up Xeon. This is how one powerful core affects the number of frames per second. And now, look at Xeon. It's completely overthrown. I did not think that energy-efficient cores are so powerful in games. A Plague Tale Requiem. Here, the difference is already less, but still, the game runs better on energy-efficient cores. Alan Wake 2, with the right two times more frames. Cyberpunk, also energy-efficient cores are two times better than the cores of a once incredibly powerful processor for $4,000. In Ghost Runner, i9 beats Xeon by 150 frames per second. God, even in Starfield, E-cores produce almost two times more frames. 
I think Xeon should be retired because it is already tired. Well, as promised, now I will connect 3090 to a power supply unit that produces only 312 watts. In order to connect such a thick graphics card to such a weak power supply unit, I had to buy as many as three adapters. Four, if you also take this into account. You'll look at this incredible beauty. Now let's see how much these wires will heat up. If you turn on the GPU stress test right away, the PC turns off instantly because the power supply goes into protection. I tweaked the GPU voltage a little, and now it eats only 200 watts and the PC does not turn off. I tested the video card for so long, then slowly but surely began to increase GPU voltage and frequency, and I reached the consumption of 270 watts by one GPU, and at the same time, the PC does not turn off. Now. The PC consumes more than what it is written on the power supply, but it does not turn off. The truth is that it buzzes like crazy. Then I got tired of waiting and I allowed the GPU to consume under 300 watts. After this, the power supply did not last long and turned off. After turning on, the PC froze, and then I realized that something was wrong. I put the RX 5 700 XT in the PC, and you see what strange stripes are on the monitor. No, everything is fine with the GPU. In short, I don't have a multimeter, but I think that it is due to the voltage drop at 12 voltage line. The power supply unit is alive, but I would not use such a PSU. And I would also not advise you to take this kit from AliExpress because the hardware is already very old. It is, of course, more or less reliable. I tested it myself. But if I were you, I would take more money and buy something on the 12th generation or on AM5. Subscribe to the channel and we will meet again very soon.